Well, let's get the content underway, and we don't, couldn't have had a better person or a better organization to lead off this introduction to the global markets and the global financial crisis, the current economic conditions, than the president, acting president of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Uh, Dr. Spinelli uh, has been with the public affairs part of the program since 1998, and in that capacity he was responsible for all public affairs outreach activities, and he actually initiated uh, a partners program which I think about three, three years ago, five years ago, uh, well, the program's been running, but we were contacted at the Southern Center, I was, and we became a partner of OPIC and uh, undertook a couple of initiatives with them, uh, but we've never been honored to have the, the president with us, and we are very honored today uh, for that to have taken place. Uh, he's also been responsible for a lot of OPEC's well-known international investment conferences. These are annual meetings that have been held since 2003 um, and draw a huge number of people and interest for people who are interested in investing around the world. Uh, Dr. Spinelli also served as OPEC's director of small business from 1998 to 2002. So it's not just the giants uh, that get financed. Far from it. OPEC is very interested uh, in small and medium-sized businesses as well. Uh, prior to joining OPEC, uh, Dr. Spinelli was vice president for corporate communications at the National Alliance for Business, and he spent a, de a decade on Capitol Hill um, working as a policy advisor for, amongst other people, uh, then-Senator Joseph Biden. Uh, so... Uh, He's had experience at uh, various levels and at various uh, points of contact uh, for, uh, with the business community, with legislation uh, that goes on around it. And uh, his background has an MA and PhD in history, interestingly, from New York University. Uh, we found that we'd both been in London together and stayed at the same place about a couple of decades apart, actually, but... Uh, nevertheless, uh, that uh, allowed a bit of reminiscing about being in London, which is always a wonderful place uh, to be. Uh, OPEC itself, uh, and I'm sure that you'll hear more from Dr. Spinelli, but uh, it's an agency of the U.S. government, as uh, I'm sure you're aware, and it really helps U.S. business invest overseas. It's particularly well known for its political risk insurance and financing arm uh, that helps businesses in over 150 emerging markets around the world. Uh, so I'm not going to take any further time, but we are delighted, and thank you for being here today. Well, thank you, Cedric, for that introduction. And it is really a pleasure for me to be here this morning uh, because the Southern Center was really one of the founding members of our partners program. And they, have, they ask very little from us. And so when they called and said, would I come and do this, I was very happy to do this. Let me also say to all of you, I used to be a college professor. And I taught full time for a number of years. And then I taught part time at American University, and I taught a class that went from 8.10 till about 10.50 at night. Uh, and I used to say those were my gold star students, uh, especially the ones that came back after the break. And so I say to all of you that are here on a Saturday morning on a, on a, on a, on a nice, a sunny, hot June day, uh, you're the gold stars, so I thank you for, for this. Um, I'm going to talk, normally when I go out to speak, I, I, I spend most of my time talking about OPEC because people either haven't heard of us or they maybe think we're OPEC the oil cartel, which is not a good thing. Uh, or they maybe know us, but they don't really know how we've changed over the years. But I'm not really going to do that today because of the focus of this. I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions about that, I, I, and I will touch a little bit on OPEC. But I really want to get to the, really the theme, the heart of what uh, today's uh, uh, conference is about, which is to 
looking at the global markets in the current economic crisis and to try to get a sense of what are the challenges and opportunities. And I'm going to give you my perspective on this. I mean, you'll hear from other speakers who will, I'm sure, have a different perspective. I mean, the great thing about you know, looking at, uh, at global markets and economics is that you know, nobody really can agree uh, on, on every little detail. But I think the one thing that we can all agree on is that um, this is the worst global economic crisis we've seen since the Great Depression. And I didn't live through the Great Depression. I grew up hearing stories about it. I'm sure you, you have either read about it or heard about it. And uh, this is certainly the worst one since then. We don't see the bread lines. People are not selling apples on street corners. But you know, in a lot of ways, and I'm sure you've got friends, or maybe even you yourself are, are, are feeling this, you, you, the realities are still there. It, it's been some tough times. You know, just to throw some statistics to, to underscore that, in the fourth quarter of 2008, advanced uh, uh, economies uh, decreased by 7.5% of real GDP. Trade flows are expected to decrease by 9.1% in 2009 without accounting for any subsequent increase in protectionism. So it's not that protectionism is doing that. It's just that this is the real hard, harsh economic facts. The International Monetary Fund estimates that by 2014, G20 countries government debt will be greater than 100% of their GDP on average. This is up from 40% in 1980, 70% in 2000. So uh, things are tough and, uh, you know, looking pretty bleak. The core of this crisis is the vulnerability revealed in the global financial system, both as the primary cause of the crisis and potentially the most significant casualty. Latest estimates have over $4 trillion. I'm going to repeat that number, $4 trillion. I hope we've not all gotten so numb that that doesn't mean anything. Uh, the estimates are that there's over $4 trillion in write-downs of bad assets are going to be needed for financial institutions, much of which has not even yet occurred. So we haven't even really seen the sort of worst and all of those write-downs. Banks are reeling right now. I don't need to tell you that. I had the news on this morning at 6.30 this morning, and there, one of the lead story was that there's another bank here in the state of Georgia that's gone, you know, is gone, gone by the wayside. Uh, banks are reeling. They have either disappeared, they've merged. They're sharply retrenching all of their lending. And if you tried to get a small business loan or even a mortgage, you, you know the realities of that. But the fact of the matter is that the really precipitous decrease in credit has come really from non-bank lenders and all of the spillover, money market funds, hedge funds, former in investment banks, which are, which are just basically just disappeared, and uh, private equity. Altogether, these sort of represented the shadow banking system, and that has just totally uh, retrenched. In the first three quarters of 2008, lending via capital markets in the United States shrank by $950 billion. By comparison, total bank lending in the U.S. in 2007 was $850 billion. Let me repeat that. So in 2007, when things were still looking good and we, we did not see that we were, we were like Thelma and Louise about to go right off that cliff, Total bank lending was $850 billion. And in the first three quarters of 2008, lending via the capital markets had shrank by actually a larger amount. I think that just gives you the enormity of how not only the banking sector has been impacted, but, but this sort of shadow banking system which has made all of this capital flow and, and really has been the underlying reason for all of the flush good times uh, for the last uh, decade. Um, President Obama just uh, last week, if you saw it on news or read in the newspaper, uh, announced uh, his initiative, his plans for um, overhauling the financial, uh, oversight of the financial industry, something that I think people have felt was long needed and to the extent that there was any financial oversight for the last uh, eight years. Uh, it, it was certainly inadequate, but in a lot of cases, there just simply wasn't any. Everybody looked around when the house of cards fell apart. But 
what that actually means, assuming that his proposals are enacted, if not totally, at least to, to a large extent. It means that in the longer term, the trend uh, in terms of financing is back, it's going to go back towards a much more conservative model of lending that we have seen in the last several years uh, with less leverage, less exotic sources of capital to base lending upon. So we're going to go back to the days when it was very conservative. It was, it was um, you know, pretty mainstream in terms of what was going on. There was not a lot of the exoticism we've seen in the last eight or ten years or so. And so finance will be more conservative and more constrained in the risk and leveraging that it will take and will be allowed to take. And that, of course, is going to have a great impact on all of you, both in your personal lives and in your professional lives. The president has made it very clear and, uh, to, in his enunciations, even before he became president, that our society is not going to allow our major financial institutions to fail in bad times. And he certainly has done a whole series of things to make sure that that doesn't happen, as did the previous administration. But he has also made it clear that the level of risk and reward that these same financial institutions will be allowed to pursue in good times must also be curtailed. We must be sure that history does not repeat itself so that once we get out of the crisis, we're like, you know, uh, uh, you know once again, drunken sailors in Las Vegas on a weekend pass. He has said that is not going to happen. His proposal that he announced last week makes it very clear that if it's enacted, even and actually there's some parts of it don't even need congressional approval, uh, it, this is not going to happen again. So we will go back to uh, a, a much greater oversight like we once had, once had. What that all means is that the massive acceleration of capital formation and the apparently nearly infinite liquidity that followed through the global economy over the past half decade will not be restored. So I guess what I'm saying is things are tough. You know that. Uh, I think they're going to eventually get better. But as they get better, understand that it's not going to be just bringing back the old model of, you know, just spending at will with no oversight. We will see a much more constrained, conservative financial sector. And I personally think that's a very good thing, but it's something that people need to factor in as they make both their personal and their business plans uh, in, in the upcoming years. Now, all of this that I have just talked about very quickly has, of course, had an enormous impact on emerging market countries throughout the world, in every region of the world. Um, it had been hoped back in the fall of 2008 that there had been a kind of decoupling of the developing world from the advanced economies and that the developing world would be spared the worst effects of, of this recession. Um, and I, I, you maybe don't remember, but this is what people had been talking about in the fall. Because there was not, a, you know, immediate impact in the developing world, people thought, oh, okay, well, we maybe we've now reached this level of, uh, of advancement and maturity that we had always hoped for so that there was this total decoupling. So what was happening in the United States was just specific to the United States and maybe a little bit in Europe, and we didn't need to worry about it. But unfortunately, this has turned out, I think, to have been overly optimistic. There are problems looming for the developing world, and there is a high likelihood that there will be lingering effects from this crisis that are going to also have long-term adverse impacts on the developing world, on emerging market countries. In the short run, the crisis has been transmitted from the advanced countries, particularly the United States, to the emerging markets through for example, financial contagion. I mean, it's not, it, it's, it's been much less than the, the rich country to rich country contagion that we've seen. As you know, I, I just was in London, you know, 
the, the, the British, the Europeans are still, you know, very mad at us because they blame a lot of what has happened to them in this crisis on us. Whether they're right or wrong, uh, I, I think there's some validity in that. But there was a direct sort of rich country to rich country contagion. The, the, you know, the, the virus started here and it quickly spread there. Um, uh, but we have not, it's not been quite that uh, uh, immediate and quite that even um, because in the poorer countries of the world, the banks and their financial institutions were not as integrated into the global financial system, which actually turned out to be a very good thing. It's like, you know, having your computer be part of a network that gets a virus uh, and you get it quickly. This would be a, you know, if you were not part of that network, uh, there might have been disadvantages to that before, but you'd be very grateful if it, one of those viruses hit. This is the same thing. So that's actually been a benefit in the way so that the, the contagion is not spread as quickly and as severely as, as, as it did to the richer countries. Um, in terms of trade, there's, there certainly has been uh, a general decrease in trade, in trade flows from emerging market countries to, uh, to the developed world. And that certainly has had an impact. And that's been sort of part of this. Um, the terms of trade have also uh, diminished in, in, or have become much more negative for emerging market countries. Uh, commodity prices have decreased, and most developing countries have, of course, some dependence on the commodity of exports. So they have suffered. So as the rich countries have suffered and have not been, you know, uh, trading as much and not e importing as many commodities or holding the prices up or the demand has not been there, it has had a rippling effect certainly in emerging market countries. Um, all told, the World Bank estimates that by the end of 2010, 250 million extra people in the developing world will have been pushed below the $1.25 a day poverty line by the combined effects of the current economic crisis and last year's food and oil price crisis. So if you think about that, by the end of 2010, that's not too far off, there are going to be 250 million extra people in addition to all the people that are already there who will be below the, you know, the poverty line. And the poverty line is, you know, a dollar and 25 cents a day. Um, that's pretty sobering in terms of the impact in the developing world. In addition to the direct effects on GDP growth in emerging market countries, there will be additional adverse effects on the living standards in less developed countries uh, because of all of this. But for other reasons, for example, remittance. I, I don't know if you all are familiar with that term, remittance. This is people who, are, who leave a country, come usually to the United States or to the developed world to work. And, but what they do is, and, their, and one of their main reasons for them to come, is they take part of the money they're earning here and they send it back home uh, in the form of remittances. This is a very important part of the economy of a lot of developing countries. We, we don't think about it, we don't realize it, but it's, it's a huge percentage. In some countries it's staggering as to how, much, how important that is, how vital it is that Salvadorans living in the United States are sending part of their money back in terms of remittances to their families in El Salvador. Remittance flows are declining, uh, of course, with the economic crisis. The World Bank forecasts that remittance flows will decrease by 8% in 2009 after many years of consistent and steady growth. This is in turn going to have a rippling effect. 8% less is going back to people in these countries. What are they going to do? It means that it's going to affect their housing, their ability to buy goods and services, maybe their ability to even buy food and eat and survive, which is going to put more burdens on the governments there that have less money. Um, so that's going to have an impact on emerging market countries. Aid flows from the rich countries are also in danger of decreasing. I mean, you know, there is not, I, I'm sure you're aware of this, you see this, you hear this, we're already hearing this uh, in the United States. 
uh, when you know people talk about they look at the situation in Michigan, for example, and the unemployment there and the problems with the car companies. You know, why are we why are we sending aid? Why do we have foreign aid? Why are we helping other countries? We need to be protecting jobs here and creating jobs here and worrying about ourselves. So already that isolationist mentality, which I would argue as a historian never really went away and has always been sort of lurking below the surface in the American spirit, uh, has come back again. You know, it's not, a, it's not an accident. And again, uh, you know, I admit my bias in my belief in history as a historian, but we just don't want to learn the lessons of history. Look back, 1929, stock market crash, the beginnings of the Depression, what happened in the early 1930s, the, the, uh, the, the largest tariff the United States ever imposed on goods coming into this country, 1931. We put up the barriers because we just wanted to protect ourselves. Of course, what did we do? We actually sent the whole world into uh, economic crisis a lot faster than it would have happened. It was the opposite, exactly the wrong thing to do. That was the knee-jerk political reaction. It's not that bad now, I, and I don't, please don't misunderstand, I am not suggesting that. And I think we are very fortunate we have a president and an administration that is totally committed to continuing, if not even increasing, the level of assistance that we give to other countries. President Obama recognizes from the beginning that this is a world situation, we need to work on this together. But there is going to be a continued pressure for reduction in any kind of assistance. And you see this in other countries, too. It's not just the United States. Again, I, as I mentioned, I was just in the United Kingdom, and that's part of the argument there. You know, why are we, you know, why are we helping Afghanistan? You know, we should be helping people here in our own country. So that's going to probably result in a, in a decrease, on top of which, of course, the other institutions that are funded by, de by the developed world, like the World Bank, the IMF, uh, even the United Nations are going to have less ability to do that. Um, and, you know, this is a critical uh, to a lot of countries. Official development assistance is 9% of gross national income in the least developed countries. So they really rely on this assistance to sustain themselves. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, over 60% of capital inflows comes from official development assistance. So you can appreciate the ramifications of if that, as that declines and, and that decreases. At the same time, another important part of helping to maintain the quality of life, what it is in developing countries, and to sustain them and to help them to maintain a level of economic development is the work of NGOs, non-government organizations, and philanthropic, philanthropic uh, institutions, organizations, foundations, peoples like CARE and Oxfam, uh, the Gates Foundation, which is, does incredible things, is doing incredible things in Africa, Calvert Foundation. Well, what's happening to foundations? They have seen this incredible decrease in their portfolios because they, you know, they were in stocks and bonds, and so they have suffered. You know, that's staggering. Universities, you know, Harvard University, I think, has lost a third of their endowment. So all of these organizations that have filled the gap when the government hasn't done it, when there's not been official aid, they're also finding that they've got to retrench uh, what they do. I mean, even the Gates Foundation, you know, is so very, you know, wealthy and well-endowed in, in its original foundation has taken a real hit you know, the Getty Foundation. I mean, so it, it really is that, that, that is a reality. And so they're not going to be able to do the things that, um, that they really need to do in terms of filling that gap, which I think is of critical importance. You know, all told, if you look at the developing world, if you look at the economic crisis as I originally sort of outlined, and then look at the impact and what it means for the developing world in terms of global marketplaces, the medium run impact on developing countries from all of this accumulative effect is, is really, in essence, means there, there's a reduced access to international capital markets. So all of the kinds of things that would be funded through that are just not going to happen. There is potentially reduced aid flows from both 
governments, developed world governments, and nonprofit and philanthropic organizations, and reduced remittances coming back from people who are working in other countries. All of this together is going to have a substantial impact in at least the medium term on the developing world. Now, I could just stop right there and really leave you all extraordinarily depressed on a Saturday morning. But I have to make a confession. Even though I have lived in Washington, D.C. for 31 years, I am an optimist. <laughs> and so I am going to, I want to leave you with the notion that what I really do believe, which is that the glass is not half empty, the glass is half full. Because I think it is not all doom and gloom in the global marketplace uh, any more than it is here in the United States, but, if, but really to focus on emerging markets and the developing world. Um, we certainly, I think, despite all of the scenario that I've outlined, need to take a look at and cannot ignore the fact that um, taken as a whole, the developing world has actually done very well in one true sense. In the past, 1980s, even probably 1990s, when the U.S. and other developed economies have sniffled, the developing world, the emerging markets, always caught pneumonia. That, I mean, it's there. The facts are there. That's, that's the history of it in the last few decades. This time, the developing world did not collapse. As I mentioned, the contagion came, the virus came, but it didn't cause the total collapse as it would have 10, 15, 20, definitely 20 years ago. And so far, the developing world, I would argue, is faring better, actually, ironically, than the advanced economies. And that may, be, that may sound counterintuitive to you, but, but that is really the, the reality. Um, obviously, there's been a decrease um, in GDP in developing e economies. But uh, the fact is that they've turned out to be, to the surprise of a lot of economists, more stable and more resilient than they had been in the past. And this has been achieved in large part, I would argue, because taken as a whole, the developing world is coming out of one of its best periods in history. If you had to pick a time in which there would be an international economic crisis for the developing world, this was probably as good as it was going to get because they were in the best, strongest position than they had been in the decades previous and therefore in a better position to withstand what was going to come. Over the last decade, developing countries for the most part have been much better at establishing prudent and sustainable macroeconomic policies and also have generally worked to improve the transparency and efficiency of their business operating environments. Now, before somebody asks me the question, I know there are exceptions to that. Believe me, I, I'm not... I'm not holding up Zimbabwe as an example that falls into that model. Uh, uh, sadly for Zimbabwe and, 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 and a few other countries, uh, they have still not achieved that. They've lost that opportunity. But if you look at a place like Sub-Saharan Africa, what Sub-Saharan Africa looked like, your picture that you would have taken, your photograph, in the early 90s versus 2007 and 2008 is very, very different. There has, you know, I think a lot of advancement has been made in terms of the macro economics of the countries, the transparency, the uh, more efficient and effectiveness of their institutions. Um, before the current financial crisis, these improvements had been paying dividends uh, in the last several years with increased investment coming from the United States and the developed world in vast portions of emerging market countries. And um, they have benefited from that, and that, that definitely happened even though it's not happening 
um, now. But what that means is, even with the economic crisis we have now, it means that, ironically, there are and there will continue to be, at least in the, I think, in the near, medium, and even long term, investment opportunities in the developing world that are just waiting for entrepreneurs with the capability to capitalize on these opportunities. Um, and so even though things look bleak, if you're an entrepreneur and if you're looking for opportunities, I think you can find some good opportunities in emerging markets. And this is not just some theoretical comment I'm making. Uh, let me give you a, a specific example. I was in California about two months ago and spoke and met with a lot of business people who said, you know, we, there's no market, there's no opportunity for us here in California for what, whatever their business is, but there's still opportunities in Mexico, in Central America, and in all of Latin America. And so they just were basically refocusing their business and doing very little domestically and actually doing a lot of things in emerging market countries. And I've heard that from other people that are finding the housing sector in the United States is in terrible shape. The housing sector in Ghana is in actually much better shape. The housing sector in Jordan, in Egypt. So there's opportunities there uh, despite everything. Now the irony is, so here's, there's opportunity. So I can see you all, you're ready to kind of, you know, grab your papers and just leave immediately and <laughs> go put together a business plan. So, but here's the problem for you. Here's the irony of this. And I apologize for this irony because it is, it's a biting irony. Here are those opportunities. And, you know, everybody says in business, you know, you want to invest when other people aren't. You want to get in when things are low, when the market is depressed. This is the time you want to go in. So I'm telling you, there's some good opportunities for you. Unfortunately, there's no capital. There's no money. The money has shrunk, as I talked about earlier. You know, whatever, as difficult or as challenging as it was for most banks, we're reluctant to do international uh, financing. But the banks that did do that, a lot of them are not doing that. Some of them don't even exist anymore. And so they're very um, conservative and restrained. So here you are. You've identified an opportunity in an emerging market country, and now you can't get the financing. And some of you may have found the same thing, and you wanted to buy a house. Um, I know people who said, oh, yeah, the, you know, even in Washington, D.C., believe it or not, the prices have come down a little bit. Say, oh, this is this great thing. And then they go to the bank who, you know, two years ago wanted 5% down and now wants 25% down. And so, of course, they can't get the financing. This is the same situation. But I told you this part of my remarks was the glass is half full. There is something that you can do. There is a place that you can find that financing. And it is the place that I work for, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. This is what we do. This is our mission. Uh, this is what we're supposed to do. We actually got our start um, back uh, at the end of World War II as part of the Marshall Plan and the rebuilding of Europe. And if you remember your history, the United States, probably for the first time in the whole history of the world, that the people that had just won a war turned around and put their hand out to the people that they had defeated to say, we want to help you. Did, why did we do this? Do we do this because we Americans are the most wonderful people? Partially. We also did it, like all good foreign policy, it was a blending of altruism and self-interest because we wanted to make sure that those countries were not downtrodden, did not then therefore become vulnerable to becoming communism and part of the Soviet bloc. We wanted to make sure they were democracies, capitalist systems with marketplaces for U.S. businesses. So we, we sort of got that and in the Marshall Plan. The challenge with the Marshall Plan was you can give foreign aid to deal with immediate needs, but how do you build the, the economy in the longer term? You know, the old Chinese proverb, give a man a fish, he eats today, teach him how to fish, he eats every day. That was the same idea. How do we rebuild these economies? General Marshall went to the business community and said, we need you to mobilize your capital and your expertise and invest in war-torn Europe. Business community said, 
General, that's a great idea, very noble, but guess what? We're here to make a profit. We're not here to, you know, pursue some noble mission. No thank you. And where would we ever get the financing, and what about the political risks? Because, after all, if I'm a Georgia business and I'm investing in Idaho, the only thing I'm worrying about is commercial failure. I go to another country, now I've got to worry about political risks. What if there's a civil war? What if there's a war? What if they change governments and they nationalize all the industries? No, forget it. So General Marshall came back and said, this is what we will do. We will create a public-private partnership. We, the U.S. government, will become for you a bank of last resort. If you can't get financing to go and invest in these countries, we will make it available to you. And then we're going to create something called political risk insurance, which is just what the title says, insure you against political risk, like having homeowner's insurance. You don't believe your house is going to burn down, but you don't want to lay awake at night saying, oh, gosh, if the house burns down, what's my, what's my plan? This is a safety net for investment. And so if something happens to your investment, we will make you whole. Business community said, this is a great idea, and they went off, and it worked. As you can see, it worked very well in Europe. In the 1950s and 60s, because the Cold War started being fought out in emerging market countries, this focus started going to the th what was then called the third world, to do the same with the same idea. If we can get U.S. private sector to create investment, economic development, create jobs, get into the marketplaces, we're going to have democracies, capitalist systems, friends of the United States. And that's what we've done. And in 1971, this function, which had been in the State Department, was made into an independent government agency called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. This consent continues to be our mission. Why do we do this in 2009? Well, you know, I think you all know this. Where there's no jobs, where there's no economic development, we have breeding grounds for terrorists. It still remains in the best interest of the United States to do what we can to support and encourage economic development in countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the countries of sub-Saharan Africa. But at the same time, we want to also make sure that U.S. businesses have an opportunity to engage in, get into those emerging markets and to be able to compete. So this is what we do. So the answer is there is opportunities in emerging market countries and where are you going to find the money? You can find it at OPEC. We are, we are, ironically, we've actually come full circle. We again, have almost become a bank of last resort because there are no other banks. Um, and we will provide funding, assuming you meet all of our requirements, that we have policy requirements, and you've got a business plan and your investment makes sense, we can help you. So I think that OPIC can not only help you, but OPIC is in some ways the perfect model for the kinds of things we've seen happen in the last year or two and for the uncertainties of the future because we are patient money. Our portfolio right now is actually doing okay in comparison to what the rest of the world is. We have got a portfolio of about $12 billion spread throughout the world. And the reason is that unlike all of those financial institutions, half of them of which don't even exist anymore, that played it fast and loose, we were always in it for the long term. And we support long-term investment. So we could be patient. We could ride it out. We weren't in for some quick in and out day. We're not day traders. You know, we're looking at this, probably the shortest term loan we would do is three years. Our loans average eight to 12 years. But what that means is that we can be patient, we can ride out the storm, and our view on risk in general is in, de is in developing countries is, of course, much more long-term because we can be very patient capital. We can lean, lean against the current winds uh, while other financial institutions are retrenching. We can continue to do our job. And I think that makes it even more relevant when things are difficult as they are now. Um, and it, it really guarantees 
that there will continue to be this support in, uh, in times ahead. Now, before I conclude, and, I'm, and I'd be happy to take your questions, um, I want to just make one last point about the challenges and opportunities in the global marketplace. I think I've outlined for you what I see the challenges are. And we know what the economic crisis in the United States has been. We know that we're still in it. I think there's a sense that maybe we've hit the bottom. I don't know that. I don't know that anybody knows that. But, but we certainly are at least beginning to see maybe some way out, but it's going to take a very long time. I think whether, it, whether we're out of this in six months, a year, two years, the one thing that I think is going to be for sure is that what follows will be a much more uh, a conservative financial marketplace because of the safeguards, the oversight that President Obama is going to, uh, as called for, imposing on the financial community because of the lessons learned. We're not going to go back to those loose, wild days of the past. So that impacts you in terms of the availability of capital. I think the emerging market countries, there are some challenges there as well, and I think they have had some of the impact of this. And, uh, but I think that there are going to be opportunities there. So then the challenge becomes, if you see investment opportunities, what do you do? I think you can look to places like OPIC, the World Bank, the IFC, which is part of the World Bank, public institutions that will continue to make uh, capital available. So I think that's where you need to go. So I think there, you will be able to take advantage of those opportunities. But I want to leave you with one last um, challenge and opportunity. And uh, this is something that is very important to me. I, I just spoke a week ago at a conference in London on sustainable development. Sustainable development, the idea that you create development and investment and in, um, in the developing world in a way that's sustainable, that leaves the place better than it was and certainly doesn't leave it worse than it was. This is something we didn't really think about up until the last few years. There, you know, people would, you know, there was investments and what impact those investments had on the host country didn't matter. People took their money and they ran. Well, we realize now there's an awareness that that's no longer acceptable. It's no longer acceptable because we, in the developed world, not everybody, but a lot of people believe that that's, that's, not, that's, that's a, a, an immoral thing to do and it doesn't make good business sense. I mean, you've all seen, uh, you know, businesses who 20 years ago wouldn't care what consumers thought and how they react today to, you know, defective products, you know, tainted products to, uh, you know, the word that comes out that, you know, they're making a particular kind of garment in a sweatshop in Thailand. Businesses now respond to that in a positive way because they understand that being socially responsible, creating sustainable development is also good business. So there's a, there's a real awareness in that. Um, and I think that that is both your challenge if you want to engage in any kind of business activity, and particularly in the developing world, to make that part of what you do. Because I, I think you need to do that, and I think you can't not do that anymore in this world. Part of that is transparency. And I, about three, two weeks after I became the acting president of OPIC, launched a new transparency initiative at OPIC to make people aware of what we do before we do it and the details of the projects we're going to support. This followed on an executive order. The second executive order that President Obama issued after becoming president had to do with making government more transparent. I think we all saw in the last, you know, uh, uh, eight years that the lack of transparency is not a good thing. So you're going to have both the challenge and the opportunity because you're going to have to do business in a more transparent way. Business people don't like to do that. They feel that that provides unfair uh, advantage to competition. Nobody want, everybody likes to keep things close to the vest. You just simply can't do business like that anymore. You've got to have a level of transparency, particularly if you're dealing with 
other with government agencies. But even if not, if you're in the developing world, the demands are going to be that you've got to act in a transparent way. And the leaders of those countries, you know, people like um, uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson in Liberia, who is demanding that all of the investment that comes to her country is done in a transparent way. So you're going to have to face that reality. You may see it as a challenge. I see it as also as an opportunity to do the right thing um, and also do something that I think ultimately makes them, makes, will, will make good business sense. And then the third challenge and opportunity for you has to do with climate change. We cannot go on as we have. Again, a priority of this administration, we at OPIC, I have made a commitment uh, in uh, February that we at OPIC will reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in our portfolio by 30% over the next 10 years. This is what we need to do. It's the right thing to do, but it's, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. Where is the opportunity? It has opened up huge opportunities in the sectors of clean technology and renewable energies, which are high top priorities for OPIC. If you've got a project in either of those sectors, you get to the front of the line at OPIC because this is the sort of thing that we want to support. It's critically important because we could do everything that we think we need to do to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, to do the right thing for climate change. And guess what? If China, India, and Brazil don't follow suit in some way, it, it really, it's all for naught. So we've got to make sure that not only are we doing this, but that we can get the rest of the world to do that. And certainly, if we've got US investors looking at these countries, that they're going and they're following you know, the highest standards that are going to make sure, again, a challenge, yes. An opportunity, absolutely. Here's the, the two ways that we're going to make sure that business understands that s sustainable development and social responsibility are ultimately good for business through death and through retirement. Because we need to get that whole old generation, my generation and, and even older than me, who, who don't grasp that concept, they need to go and we need to have your generation take their place because I think you get that. You understand instinctively, you have grown up with that to know that these are the right things to do but they're also not antithetical to also doing um, good business. Um, let me just uh, conclude by two things. Number one, actually three things. Number one, uh, if you'd like any more information about OPIC, we have a terrific website, if you don't mind my saying that, at www.opicopic.gov. All kinds of information about things that I didn't have a chance to talk about are up there. Secondly, uh, those of you who uh, may, uh, you know, you all may be gainfully employed, but if you're in graduate school or whatever, I wanted to mention to you that we have an internship program. Uh, during the year, fall and spring, we have unpaid internships. You have to apply for them. They're very competitive, but they're unpaid. But in the summer, which it's too late now, unfortunately, but uh, for next summer, we actually have paid internships. And we, we do hire some undergraduates, mostly graduate students, a lot of business students. And depending on what your interests are, you actually can get into like the finance department and work on projects with people. So it is an incredible experience. Beyond the networking that was mentioned earlier, uh, it is really a, a great opportunity for you to really learn something uh, firsthand. So I mentioned that there's information about that uh, on the website. And then finally, if you'll just allow me, I, I feel I guess at the age of 56, I, I can now sort of give advice to people. I remember when I was all well, your age, and I used to think, oh, why, is, why are they telling me that? You know, leave me alone. I'll figure it out myself. So uh, you may well have that same response to what I'm about to say. But for those of you out there, um, I, I, sitting here and, and listening to Cedric's introduction, I have to tell you absolutely, honestly, uh, when I was your age, I could have never imagined or fathomed that my professional life would take all of the paths that it ultimately took, that I would end up 
you know, being at, at OPIC for 10 years, that I would end up being the acting president, that I would end up doing all the things that I did. And so I guess what I would say to you is that I think life is like a river that's sort of flowing, and you're, you know, sitting there or standing there right on the banks, and I don't, I, I don't overthink it. If you see an interesting uh, branch or log coming down that river, grab onto it and take it because you just never know. Um, I think life ultimately does take you where you're supposed to go, but I think you've got to sort of be out there and just grab opportunities as opposed to having just a sort of a linear idea. So that is my two cents for you to take or not take uh, or, you know, dismiss. But um, I would say that to you. I mean, even in these tough economic times, uh, just sort of look for those opportunities and try things because especially when you're, when you're uh, younger. I always tell people I'm very fortunate. I had my midlife crisis in my 20s and my 30s. I got sort of got it all out of my system. So anyway, let me, uh, let me stop there and thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That's right. I'll stand here. Um, that's a good question. Our loan size goes from as little as $100,000 up to $250 million per project. So um, uh, the average loan size, it's a tough one to answer because it really sort of depends, but it runs that range. There's one significant difference. If you're a small business, and you want less than $35 million in terms of a loan, we can do this as a direct loan, and the process is a little bit simpler. It doesn't have to go to our board of directors, and it's uh, less expensive. If you want more than that, we do it as a loan guarantee, and it has to go before our board, and our board only meets quarterly, so that sort of makes a difference. But I would say our small business in terms of small and medium-sized businesses, our average loan size is like two to five million dollars. One statistic you didn't give us, I don't believe, was um, private investment flows. Uh, what is your best indication? I know it's early days to measure it. Uh, what has happened to private investment flows over the last 12 months or so? Well, I think that private investment flows have, they've slowed down. I can't give you a specific number off the top of my head. They've slowed down, but the one thing that's happened is that a lot of those, uh, th th those, uh, in those investors are actually now coming to places like OPIC, which they wouldn't have. I mean, it's ironic. People say to me, oh, in you know, these tough economic times, I, you guys must not be doing anything. Well, actually, quite the opposite. The interest in OPIC and the amount of projects we're working on has increased because, as I mentioned earlier, there, there, there are no other or very few other financial institutions. But actually, the quality of the projects we're seeing is much better because a lot of those projects in the past would not have come to OPIC. They would have went to a bank, and so they're now coming to us. They would go to, why would they go to a bank? They'd go to a bank because they might get better pricing on a loan. Um, but secondly, because when you work with us, we have policy requirements. So businesses may or may not, gets back to my whole idea of sustainable development. If you work with us, you've got to meet environmental standards, worker rights standards, human rights standards. If you go to a bank, you don't have to do that I mean, unless you want to do that, which you should do that, but, you know, that's your choice. Yeah, thanks. Are you giving a 
loan to a person going into a certain type of country that we have relations with, you want to have better relations with, or we have trade flow issues that you want to encourage more business um, between the countries? Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, we are open in uh, about 156 emerging market countries, and those are all the countries in which OPEC has a relationship we're allowed to do business. And the, the biggest probably glaring om omission f from that list, besides for the sort of obvious like Cuba, is China. After Tiananmen Square, Congress closed our programs down as sort of a response to that, and it, they haven't opened them up. It's 20 years later. It would take an act of Congress to do that. But we're sort of everywhere else. We are in a, we're demand driven in the sense that we need somebody to come to us with a project. So while we, in terms of our outreach, our, um, and, and the, uh, the conferences we put on and those kinds of things, we can say these are our priorities. So our priorities right now are Afghanistan, which is these are the administration's uh, foreign policy priorities, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, other parts of the Middle East, West Bank, places like Jordan, Sub-Saharan Africa. Those are the... The, the regional priorities. All the easy countries, right? Yeah, all the, right, all the easy countries. Um, and as far as um, uh, sectoral priorities, really the two sectoral priorities are at this point would be renewable energies and clean technology, which are not always the same thing. We would consider any other projects, but those are sort of the two things that we're really out there emphasizing. We do a lot of things in the housing sector. We do hotels. We do financial institutions. I mean, for example, in a lot of countries, we take it for granted that we have a mortgage market. In a lot of countries, if you want to buy a house, you need to have like 80 or 90 percent of the cost of the house as the down payment. I don't know about you, but if that was the way here, I wouldn't own my house. So we've tried to support financial institutions in order to create a, a mortgage market. The critical thing for us, if you want to come to OPIC and want some money, I mean, three things immediate. Number one, do you want to do this in a country where we're open for business? You can find that out on the website. Number two, do you have experience in what you want to do? Now that may seem like an obvious question. I, I'm telling you at least once a week I get a phone call from somebody who says, you know, I've been, you know, making uh, chairs for the last 20 years, but I'd really like to open up a resort hotel in a tropical rainforest. Will you give me $20 million? It's like, no, no, well, why would we do this? So either you or your partner has to have experience in this, and then you need to have 25% U.S. equity in the project. That is a re legal requirement under, uh, under our statute that created OPEC. So it could be you as an individual putting up that 25% or your company, the rest of it, the 75% can come from anywhere. And most of our projects are a combination of a U.S. investor or business and a local partner because it usually makes sense if you're going to go into Afghanistan or Jordan or Egypt that you've got a local partner. But we need to have at least that 25% U.S. equity, which we can play around with. So if you've got 20% or 18% or even lower, but like, for example, you're going to do a McDonald's franchise, which means that you're going to have to be buying things from McDonald's and have service contracts. We can play around that. But that's sort of our benchmark. And you need a business plan. How's this going to work? Because we do, we are, you know, we're not giving you the money. I mean, we're charging you interest rates, and we won't want our money back. And you as U.S. taxpayers want to hear me say that, say we want to get paid back. And so we want to look at your business plan and say, are the – Revenue flows from the project going to be adequate for you to pay the loan. So those are the things we look at. Last question, John. Yeah. This is a, a conceptual question. Um, you've got the world before September or April, depending on last year. Um, and is this on? Yeah. And the conceptual question is this, that basically um, Keynes is now king. And we're now seeing the politicization of Western financial markets. And it, this revolves around beware what you get in doing this, in the sense that uh, you know, you're talking about developing countries that whenever the Chinese give a loan, there's a whole laundry list of, of requirements that are politically driven. There's geopolitical issues as well. And so the, the, the kind of issue comes that 
is, is this politicization of the whole thing. And you know, once you've gone down this road, where does this lead? How can America now talk about free trade when you've got a completely political kind of environment where it is not free because you know, General Motors, you know, you've already mentioned about human rights. And, you know, if you were to go down to Barclays Bank or you were to go over to Citigroup, you would not find in the fine print that you must, you know, we'll give you a loan for 200 million as long as your human rights program is this and uh, you, know, you have a certain percentage of global market. The other side of it is you're now going to compete directly in the marketplace of the Chinese and the Russians who this is their drive. And, and is your organization and, other organ and the, the administration uh, fully cognizant of that this has changed the rules of capital formation, to change the rules of liquidity, especially when they are the haves and we're the have-nots. They have $637 billion worth of treasury bonds. Russia has a $138 billion. And there's some states are going to say, because it is a political game and you're now playing in our backyard, here are the rules, you can't do that. How's that going to work out now that you're playing in that sandbox? Well, I think that the, I think the real challenge is that in terms of sustainable development is that you're exactly right. In a place like Africa, we have, I, I'm just going to talk from an OPIC perspective, we put policy requirements on our projects. So our project, it may turn out that because of those requirements, our project sponsor may lose out on a project. Oftentimes it is to Chinese investors that don't have those same criteria. We've required for 25 years that U.S. businesses adhere to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which doesn't exist in too many other countries. Some Western European countries have this, um, which Chinese companies don't have to adhere to, which says, you know, you can't bribe people and things like that. Um, so I think that it always is a challenge. The answer is you've got one of two ways that you can deal with it. You can say, okay, uh, the only way we can compete is we're going to even the playing field by getting rid of all of these things that are encumbrances on us. I don't think that's where we're going to go. I think we as a people, and certainly this administration, if anything, has renewed our commitment to these ideals that when we do an investment and when we are in another country that we are standards that are our standards that we're going to adhere to even if it creates a competitive disadvantage. I think the difference is, is what we're trying to now do um, to some limited success is to get, first of all, the people in the host countries to embrace this idea to see that this is better for them so that they're going to give pushback and at the same time to work with the Chinese and the Russians to sort of also get them to come closer to what our standards are. You know, is that pie in the sky? Maybe. It's no accident, though, that on her first trip, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton went to China, and what did she mainly want to talk about? Climate change. So I think we're beginning, at least in the environmental areas, making some headway with the Chinese government and understanding that not only within China, but actually the investments that they do in other countries that they are going to, they, they need to sort of come closer to what our, what our model is. But I, for whatever challenges there are and however restrictive that may be, I think the commitment to that is unwavering, not only in this administration, but I mean in, I think certainly in Western European countries. I do not believe people will want to weaken that and, 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 and that certainly my, would be my view also. Well, at that uh, note of interest. I think, Dr. Spinelli, we could go on for quite some time uh, with questions and discussion and dig down into the details, but you've uh, tempted us, you've whetted the appetite, and you've directed us to at least uh, one of the few remaining sources of finance. And thank you very much for your thank you. contribution. Thank you. Thank you.